when it comes to our overall health and well-being, lots of people are, of course, focused on some of the top level issues such as sleep, eating well, hydrating, moving your body, possibly even including some kind of a meditative or or journaling, spiritual practice, something along those lines. But there's one very important part of our overall health and wellness that most of us are not even aware of that is critical to good health and that we all need to learn more about it. It is your vagus nerve. Chances are you've never heard of it. And that's why today I am delighted to be talking with my friend and colleague and my go-to person for all things vagal nerve health, Dr. Navaz Habib. Navaz, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you again, Mira. You know, I love that this has really been a passion project for you for so many years. I remember when you and I first met, your first book had just come out. And now here we are all these years later, your revised, improved book is now out and you are lecturing all across the world and really helping people understand about the vagus nerve. And so I would love if we could just start with what is the vagus nerve? Absolutely. Uh, it's it's such an important topic and, and I, you're absolutely right. It's been overlooked for a long mm -hmm. time, even in the medical system. And so this is something that I think as individuals take on the role of being their own empowerment coach, their own accountability partner, their own uh doctor in some sense, right? That they are, they need to become aware of all of the intricacies of creating health. Mm -hmm. And one of those big pieces that seems to be overlooked overall for me is the vagus nerve and how the brain communicates with so many different organs and systems within the body. And that has everything to do with the vagus nerve and the mm -hmm. autonomic nervous system. So what the vagus nerve is, as we know it, as it's been referred to over the last kind of few thousand years, is it's our 10th cranial nerve. So we've got 12 pairs of cranial nerves. These are the nerves that come out of the brainstem. And most of them, in fact, all of them, except for the vagus nerve, remain in the head cavity. They all mm -hmm. stay within the the um, cranium and the head so the optic nerve we've got um, the glossopharyngeal nerve which is number nine we've got the trigeminal nerve and we've got the facial nerve and they all stay within the head and the neck region but the vagus nerve which is the 10th of those 12 and it is a bit of a misnomer the vagus nerve is uh we we it sounds like it's one nerve in reality it's two one on each side of the body and it comes out from the medulla oblongata at the brainstem and it comes down uh, and it has a few branches in and around the head and then it comes down and it essentially branches off to connect with almost every single organ wow. inside of our entire body and in our visceral organs this is so unique because there's nothing else in the body that does anything like this these two nerves will uh, run alongside our carotid artery and our jugular vein in our neck so when you go and you find your pulse you're actually very close to it within a mm. couple centimeters and you're uh in interestingly it goes down and it connects to the heart it connects to the lungs it connects to the stomach the spleen the liver the pancreas the kidneys the entire digestive system the stomach you name it every organ that we can name has a connection to the vagus nerve that is unique within the body. The name vagus actually comes from the root word vague, which came from the root or the, the concept of wandering or wanderer. Mm. And that's what, when we were initially kind of looking at this as anatomist eyes, trying to figure out what is this thing that's going everywhere? It just goes everywhere. It wanders. It's very vague. What it does it must be the vagus nerve. That's where the name convention came from. So 
you know, I'm curious that it sounds like it's so important that it connects with every single major organ in the body. It's the only one that runs all the way down the body. And yet nobody talks about it except you, of course, uh, <laughs> we don't really understand it. So I would, I guess I'm curious to know what led you to decide that this was your field of study and are we beginning to see more medical interest in the function of the vagus nerve? I will say the short answer to that last question you had there, no question. It is mm -hmm. absolutely becoming um, a forefront marker and a forefront of all the new research that is being done. We're realizing just how important this mm -hmm. nerve is to overall function and not just overall function, but optimal function. And that I think is really important. My interest in it started a long time ago. I was uh, a huge neuroanatomy nerd. I loved looking into the brain. In high school, I remember uh, building a brain structure out of plasticine or Play-Doh as my um, 12th grade biology project. I built it out and I labeled all the areas and I was so interested. I was it was so intricate. I did half the brain and I still remember my mom has, uh, I, I think it's stuck around in our house for nearly 20 years <laughs> uh, in my parents' place, but it's gone now, sadly. Um, but it had a little, used little toothpicks and little sticker labels to mark off. This is the frontal lobe and this is the medulla and this is the occipital lobe. And it just, it always really was this unique thing to understand how something so abstract has such an important controlling mechanism to all of the organs in the body. Mm -hmm. And I was just always so connected to this concept of that brain body connection. And I realized that a lot, in fact, almost every single other nerve in the body has more of a sensory or motor component to it. Mm -hmm. It didn't have this uh, the same connection as the vagus nerve really did. The vagus nerve and its sympathetic counterparts, which we'll talk about in a moment, are the two sides to this coin that innervate the organs internally mm. more so than anything else. The skeletal nerves go to the skin and to the muscles in the vast majority, and they don't go to the organs quite as much. So this was something that was unique. It didn't run within the brain or it didn't run within the spinal cord, excuse me. It didn't run um, in, in the same fashion as the vast majority. So there had to be something unique about this particular nerve when I was going through my own study. And about 20, 22 years ago, there was a study done out of the Feinstein Institute in, um, I believe it's in the Northeast of the US somewhere. I forget exactly where. That said, Kevin Tracy, who runs the Feinstein Institute, had uh, a huge study done where they discovered that the vagus nerve runs a system called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. Hmm. What that means is this system is reliant on the vagus nerve to identify signals of inflammation within the body, wow. run up to the brain, Tell the brain what's going on and then send a signal down to via the vagus nerve to all those organs, as well as to the spleen, which then sends out even more of this information to control the inflammatory response, hmm. to slow down inflammation. This was, for me, this was the crux. This was where it all really began because we really needed to understand that the vast majority of conditions that we are looking at now have a massive component of inflammation as a common pathway, right? We have all of these root causes that we look for in kind of the functional world. We're looking for dietary and nutritional deficiencies. We're looking for stress, uh, emotional, psychological stressors. We're looking for physical stressors. We're looking for all of these root causes, but all of those root causes have a common pathway to creating disease. Mm -hmm. And that common pathway is inflammation that is not controlled and there's an inflammation. epidemic of chronic inflammation going on right now that's exactly it right we have this the the load of stressors that we have to deal with now has just increased massively particularly psychologically 
because we're dealing with, you know, social media, we're constantly connected to everything all the time. We're watching the politics and, you know, pick a side and all of these chaotic things that in, in objective reality don't really matter. And yet it affects us in mm -hmm. such a challenging way. Right. And we're seeing it happen with younger people more and more because they're so connected and they're not guided in a very particular way anymore because it's now become this generational connection. We're getting into this generational area where it's difficult to be disconnected from the world. Well, it's especially, different. you know, you pointed out how much we're exposed, you know, even one generation, but definitely two generations ago, if something happened halfway around the world, you didn't find out about it for weeks or possibly even months. And now five minutes and everybody knows about it. Exactly. This is that that connection that can be positive and i'm not here to down anything sure. about the internet or social media by any means but i think our reliance and our connectivity to it adds just exponential levels of stress to our body and so well sorry. what i was going to say is what i what i'm hearing is we have all of this interconnectivity, but we're not learning how to self-regulate in response to that. Exactly right. I think what we're doing right now is we have all of these challenges that are pushing on the accelerator of life, mm -hmm. and we are not equipped well enough to learn how to push the brakes effectively. Mm -hmm. And if we do learn how to, the brakes are burning out much more quickly than they used to. That is that such analogy. a fabulous analogy. I <laughs> love this that. Analogy the fits are well out. With, yeah. The analogy fits well with the system that I'm going to be explaining because in reality, the accelerator is the sympathetic nervous system. It's the mm -hmm. fight or flight, the stress response, the engagement system. It's mm -hmm. necessary. We need that system working, right? Just like a car that doesn't have an accelerator is a complete useless piece of junk sitting in the garage. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't get yeah. anywhere. But a car that has a working accelerator and no working brake is much more mm. dangerous. Yeah. And the brakes in our body system is the vagus nerve. And that's why it's so special and so unique to me because the brakes are what we need to work on to ensure that they are working effectively. Not too many people have a problem pushing the accelerator. We can get mm -hmm. stressed out very easily. We have a big challenge learning how to effectively maintain and run the brakes because a car that has an accelerator and no brakes is much more dangerous to everybody around it, including the occupants of that vehicle. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so essentially what I'm hearing is the vagus nerve actually is a, a key, if not the major player in our parasympathetic nervous system, our our rest, digest, relax. Yes, system. That's exactly right. It is the uh, the major branch of the parasympathetic component. So we've got this system called the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. within our nervous system that we know of, and the automatic component or the autonomic component means these are the things that are happening automatically within our body without conscious thought. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to think about my heart beating. I don't need to think about my liver pulsating and detoxing through. We don't need to think about peristaltic motion in the gut or the release of uh, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, right? We do need to think about where we're moving and how we're uh, interacting with our environment. And that's conscious thought. Autonomics are the things that we don't consciously need to think of. Mm. But then that autonomic control, we have these two branches, which is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetics are what we call that fight or flight system. And this is the engage system. This means we need it to be able to go and do things. But if it's used too much, we can go into fight or flight. Mm. And then on the opposite side, we have the parasympathetic nervous system, the vast majority of which is run through the vagus nerve. We have other nerves for the lower part of the body um, coming out of the uh, the sacral region, but mm -hmm. the vast majority comes from the vagus nerve. And that area is the breaks. It's exactly what you said, the rest, digest. And I've added a really important one in there, the restore. Mm -hmm. We cannot restore, we cannot heal if we are in a sympathetic state. 
We have to be in a parasympathetic state with our vagus nerve working in order for the healing process to be enabled and to occur within our bodies. That is so fascinating. And, you know, so as someone who, who specializes in gut health and chemical cleanup, obviously digestion relies heavily on that parasympathetic system. And so can you talk a little bit about the vagus nerve and, and gut health, especially when it comes to people who may be dealing with chronic gut health issues? Yeah, this is uh, a really huge component. What we've realized over the last 30, 40 years in um, functional and nutritional medicine is that gut health plays a massive role in the production of so many different diseases. And the components to this that are necessary to understand are the microbiome, mm -hmm. which is the bacteria, parasites, viruses, yeast, and worms that live within our digestive tract, everywhere from our mouth to our anus, and the entirety between. We know that the interface that we have, which is literally those very thin layers of cells running, uh, protecting our internal environment from the digestive tract, is very thin, but it's a very important interaction that occurs there. And we have what many people call our second brain that is right below that, which is the enteric nervous system, mm -hmm. which is trying to figure out what's going on in the gut. Within that area, we also have 70% of our immune cells by volume located in the lining of the gut. So we have so many of these very important connecting points in the gut right? We've got everything from the microbiome inside to the food that's coming through as it uh, functions to the epithelial lining to the enteric nervous system. Plus a whole bunch of our neurotransmitters are manufactured in the that's gut. Exactly so like brain right. health comes from there. A huge piece there, right? 90 to 95% mm -hmm. of our serotonin is located in the gut. The dopamine yeah. I think is around that 75, 80% mark. So many of these important symbiotic markers come in through this system. But how do they connect to the brain? How does the brain know what's going on in the gut? The answer is the microbiome gut brain connection, which is literally physically the vagus nerve. Wow. The vagus nerve is what connects the enteric nervous system to the central nervous system. 80% of the information on the vagus nerve is coming up from all of these organs, mm -hmm. vast majority from the gut, making its way up to the brain to tell the brain what is going on in mm -hmm. those organs. There was a recent study that came out in nature literally a month ago, month and a half. And this showed the exact physical relay mechanism in the vagus nerve that has signals of lipopolysaccharide, which is bacterial endotoxin mm -hmm. that shows up in the gut when we have a leaky gut wow. going up through the vagus nerve to the nuclei of the vagus nerve in the brainstem. And when we sever the vagus nerve or we have damage to the vagus nerve, that signal can up and that creates dysregulation in our mm. response to the stressor. Mm -hmm. Wow. That shows so, how important that signal is. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it sounds incredibly important. And so what does it mean for people who have some sort of chronic health issue, whether it's, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, colitis, gastroparesis, like any of that, how, how is that tied into the vagus nerve? It literally is the manifestation of those conditions. Every single oh, one that you named wow. off will be linked to microbiome dysbiosis in some level. It'll sure. be linked to some level of leaky gut syndrome or hyperactivation of the immune system into an inflammatory state, mm -hmm. especially in those inflammatory bowel diseases like the Crohn's and the colitis. I want to add in SIBO as well, sure. because we have a, um, a lack An of overgrowth right? and the overgrowth that it's a negative uh, backflow into the small intestine from the large intestine. Mm -hmm. And so tonicity and tonality in those organs is uh, that information is relayed through the vagus nerve to those organs. So we get the information up, the brain processes it and it has to go back down through the rest of the body, primarily through the vagus nerve to those organs to say, yes, we need peristaltic motion or yes, we need inflammatory control or yes, we need the stomach to pump out hydrochloric acid and to pump the food through. And so gastroparesis is one of those that's a direct 
known connection to the vagus nerve, but anything that causes the gut to become dysfunctional overall mm -hmm. in terms of function means that the vagus nerve is in some way connected and not working. Wow. So that actually brings up an interesting question. Without going to a doctor to have whatever kinds of studies they do to check your vagus nerve, are there like simple ways we can look and see how our vagus nerve is or isn't working? Like, is there a way to tell? There's a couple of tests. So I get into a couple of them in the book. I've got things like the Bolt score test, which is a great one to understand your uh, reaction to carbon dioxide internally. Um, I've got the bowel transit time test as well, mm. which is a very simple one you can use with uh, just white sesame seeds to test how long it takes from when you ingest to when you start and finish seeing it in your stools. The best way across the board to understand how vagus nerve is working and which state you're in, whether you're pushing on the accelerator or pushing on the brakes more, mm -hmm. the answer to it all comes down to heart rate variability, HRV. Mm, yeah. HRV is the answer to understand are we pushing more on the accelerator, more on the brakes, and where are we sitting on average? Mm -hmm. okay. And that is something that over the last decade has become much more accessible, something that we can look at uh, all the time. Now, granted, wearable devices, which I'm going to kind of get into a little bit, vary significantly in their accuracy. I'm not a proponent of using any of these in a diagnostic manner or being sure. able to understand um, where somebody's at, but I love them for understanding trends. Mm. Okay. So this is a great way to understand trend data and where your body tends to stand. And on a day-to-day -day basis, where are you compared to your average? So don't use any of this information as diagnostic in any way. And don't compare device to device because they are all, all actually very different in how they read the data that is then coming through. Okay. When Good to comes, know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so in medical offices, the gold standard, without a doubt, to understand heart rate variability is EKG or ECG. What we're looking for with heart rate variability is the number of milliseconds between beats of the heart. So every time you see an R spike on an ECG scan for anybody who knows what it looks like, where you see that tall spike, you want to time from there until the next one in number mm -hmm. of milliseconds. That's the goal. And then you average that over a period of time. And there's different ways to do that. There's um, SDNN, there's RMSSD, there's P, uh, PN50. There's different algorithmic methods of understanding what that data means. But that measurement of number of milliseconds averaged over a period of time and looking for variations within that. Mm -hmm. What that means is we want variability. And the more variability we have, the more we're learning how much time is on the accelerator and the brakes. And that tells mm. us that the brakes are working. Okay. Higher variability to a point is what we're looking for. We do not want our heart to beat like a metronome. If it mm -hmm. does, it tells us the vagus nerve is not working. Mm. So if our heart is beating very rhythmically and the number of milliseconds is equal, beat to beat to beat to beat to beat, or very close to it, that tells us that we're not able to slow the heart down during that time and the brakes are not working. We need to be able to shift back and forth. So we want mm -hmm. high levels of variability. The higher the variability, the more we're able to use the brakes and the more the vagus nerve is signaling to the heart to slow everything down and put sure. us into that rest, digest and recover state. And so wearable technology is this amazing tool that over the last decade has been able to empower a lot of people to know what's going on in their uh, autonomic nervous system function. And I love the tools because they're they're just great for us being able to take back control of uh, where we're at and, and understand that how we feel and what's objectively happening are able to give that. So things like the Aura Ring, I've got five plus years of data on my Aura Ring. Um, things like whoop band, things like bio strap, things like polar H10 uh, chest straps. They're all great. Garmin's, Apple watches, they all have their positive benefits. Mm -hmm. Go and choose one that works well for you. If you've been thinking about doing a wearable, 
do your research, figure out which one makes the most sense in terms of health tracking. Personally, I don't like my, my wrist buzzing every time I get a new email. So I'm absolutely happy to keep something that doesn't buzz. Yeah. Uh, but I also have to take it off when I'm weight training. So there's a kind of a give and take for each one. Try to figure out what, what works best for you and which one you feel can fit into your life the easiest. But then use that information to extrapolate data to understand how you feel relative to that data. And you'll start to notice I wake up now and I'm like, okay, my sleep score is at 84 today, I think. Pretty good. And I'm usually within a few now. But understanding that I slept well, I feel rested, I feel ready to take on a new challenge today, or today's not a day to take on a challenge because my HRV is lower than average. I feel like I've overdone it or I've pushed myself too hard or I did something that I wasn't supposed to do. And now mm -hmm. I need a day of recovery. And so I don't push myself that day. And that's a great way to understand and then utilize that data on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it sounds like using that data, we can then look at different methods or different strategies to help support vagal nerve health and perhaps balance the system a little bit more. What are some of the strategies that someone might use for that? You're exactly right. And that's that's what this data is meant to be. For me, it's an action device. Tell me if my HRV is good, go push yourself today because you're going to be able to recover more quickly. Sure. And so on the days when it's lower, these uh, strategies can be implemented far more effectively to push us into that state of recovery more readily. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, everything vagus nerve related to improve your heart rate variability, to improve your vagus nerve function, ultimately, it all comes down to the effectiveness of your breath. Mm. The breath is the key to understanding this. So the reason for this is we have a process in our body called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. What that means is respiratory means breathing, sinus means heart, and arrhythmia means the rhythm that your breathing changes your heart sinus rhythm, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And what that means is when we inhale, we have a different effect on the heart than when we exhale. When we inhale, we're actually pushing the accelerator. We're sending a signal through our sympathetics to push us into fight or flight, which is okay. We should be, right? That's the equal balance between accelerator and brakes. When we exhale, we're pushing the brakes. And what okay. we need to do is catch ourselves to realize that we're spending more time in inhale or more time in exhale. And ideally, more time in exhale is what we want to be doing. But often, if we're feeling stressed and our HRV is low, what you're going to find is you are breathing with more inhale time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Secondary, so that's like hyperventilating, basically. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. And so things like practices like personal breathing when you're feeling anxious or you're feeling tired are meant to slow down your exhalation mm. time so you can push back towards vagus nerve and parasympathetic activation. And for those who have not seen the breathing interview that I did a long time ago, we always want to make sure also that we are breathing from our belly and not our chest because that's so going to be much got... better for us. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia plus breathing mechanics is second. Yeah. So I think this is a huge, great way to segue to this. So the breathing pattern is one thing, and then the breathing mechanics is second. There's three things that need to happen. We need to focus on the exhale, longer mm -hmm. exhales. We need to breathe through our nose, ideally, primarily. Especially the inhales need to happen through the nose. Okay? So mm -hmm. the nose has nose hairs. What they do is they filter the air as we breathe it in. Just a fun little side note, we breathe about seven quarts of air every minute, which is wow. <laughs> so, fun little stat. That air, if it goes through the nose, gets filtered through those hairs, goes into the sinuses where the air is warmed and humidified in the sinuses, and then it goes down to the lungs where it can be utilized very effectively and cleanly. If we're breathing through the mouth, we don't have hairs in our mouth to filter that air out. So we lack that ability to filter out particulate matter when we're breathing through our mouth. The air doesn't have the ability to get humidified as easily. If we do, the humidification comes from our salivary glands, which often results in a dry mouth. So if you wake up with a very dry mouth in the morning and you're like, I just need a sip of water because 
I'm feeling parched first thing in the morning. That's a direct sign that you were breathing through your mouth all night. Mm. There's some tools we're going to use for that. <laughs> and then you mentioned it already, diaphragmatic belly breathing. Mm. We don't want to be breathing through our chest. The other thing that happens, we I've caught a lot of people doing this, but I put one hand on the chest, one hand on the belly, and I get people mm -hmm. to take a breath and see which hand is moving as we take those inhales and exhales. And if we're inhaling and our chest is the one that's moving and expanding, that's a sign that we're sending a sympathetic signal to our body mm -hmm. to turn on the fight or flight mechanism again. So in order to turn on that parasympathetic system, to turn on the vagus nerve, breathe through your nose, breathe into your belly, and slow, long exhales. Those are the three keys to ensure that you are breathing in the most calm, effective manner. You'll often catch yourself. Imagine you jump in the shower, uh, turn it on, and it's just this freezing cold water yeah. that hits you. The first thing that happens, tighten up, <laughs> right? We get really, really tight. We Our voice goes into this situation. We're breathing short and shallow. We're breathing through our mouth. Mm. My gosh, what's happening? That's a sympathetic reaction, mm -hmm. okay? That sympathetic reaction, if we're creating that on a minute level by breathing through our chest, breathing through our mouth, and breathing focused on inhales, is actively just gently pushing us into that sympathetic state more so. And that's not allowing us to be in that recovery, vagus nerve activated, rest, mm -hmm. digest, recover state. And that's where we need to be. So we need to teach ourselves while under stress to breathe more effectively. So I've alluded to the cold shower. Yeah. That initial burst of cold that hits you, it's meant to push you into sympathetic state. But that's a tool you can use to start to teach yourself that it's just cold water. Yeah. And you can move over and teach yourself to breathe calmly, diaphragmatically, nasally mm -hmm. while and under stress. And I'm going to share that I don't like that first cold burst of <laughs> like I stand outside and wait till the water's warm. But then yeah. when I'm done with my shower, I begin to slowly dial it down because I'm also one of these people where, you know, we do um, we have a pool in our yard and in the winter it gets very cold and we will ice plunge. Yes. My husband, bless him to pieces, can wade in. I, on the other hand, have to like go to the deep end, stand there and breathe a couple times and then just jump <laughs> because in. I can't, <laughs> like, I don't like that sudden. I much prefer the gradual dial down, but it's still yeah. getting cold. Like, and That's the perfect. other thing that I find really interesting is when I first started doing it, it was just uncomfortable overall. But then I got to the point where the cold water on my head felt so good it was like invigorating so that was kind of amazing random question were you perimenopausal at the time when it became more calming <laughs> yes actually that's <laughs> funny so is that why <laughs> uh it just fun observation but i found that happen much more commonly in perimenopausal females as they're uh including something like a cold plunge they often find temperature regulation uh, to be very difficult. And this is a great way to uh, include that into um, a, a tool to calm you down, to get you into a more comfortable state. So just thought yes. that was a fun observation. That's fascinating. Um, <laughs> so speaking of tools, I remember yeah. the last time I saw you, you mentioned that there is also uh, some sort of a device that helps to stimulate the vagus nerve and support that down regulation and, you know, essentially calming the system. Can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly. The, I still am very important, uh, very strong on the idea of learning to breathe effectively because we don't always have access to tools around, but I think that's a foundational thing. And we can tie a lot of exercises to that humming, chanting, gargling, mm -hmm. singing, cold plunges and the breath that you focus on through them. These are all important and very foundational, but often people are in a situation where they need therapeutic support. And these mm -hmm. foundational things are just not enough. They don't tend to be strong enough to get the vagus nerve up and running effectively and easily and powerfully. And this is where we can start to look into nutrition and other tools and devices that are out there. So, on the tools and devices side, because you've asked this wonderful question, we have a lot of research over the last 15 to 20 years on 
what happens if you cut the vagus nerve and what mm. happens if you make it work better? And the answers have been absolutely one-sided. We don't want to cut the vagus nerve and we want to stimulate it yeah. to make it work better, period. The tools that have been developed have gone from invasive vagus mm. nerve stimulators that are literally um, surgically implanted and coiled around the vagus nerve to electrically stimulate it to devices that you can physically put on your neck, like this guy right here, which we'll talk about in a second, directly onto the vagus nerve where you find your pulse and have a very similar positive experience in a very short mm. time to devices that are on the ear. It takes a little longer for those to work because the number of branches on the vagus nerve in the ear are very, very minimal. Mm. But there are these amazing tools out there. And these are all vagus nerve stimulators. One that I'm a huge fan of that I've found to be the best researched tool, the one that kind of started the whole trend of non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation outside of acupuncture and auricular acupuncture and uh, traditional Chinese medicine is this guy right here called True Vega. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, developed by the inventors of this entire technology and what it is is a two lead electrical system that when you go directly over the vagus nerve has been shown through fMRI data to stimulate those exact areas that the vagus nerve goes into the brainstem and to have a very beautiful, positive, calming effect on uh, the central nervous system. So it mm -hmm. activates the thalamus, which initiates sleep, uh, mm -hmm. helps you get over fatigue, it helps you get into a state of calm relaxation. It improves your memory when that's working really well. And it has okay. just this amazing effect on inducing that calming rest, digest, recover state within mm. the body. Um, fMRI data doesn't lie, obviously. And yeah. the auricular stuff works. It just takes longer. And the invasive stuff, if you don't need to surgically put it into your body, the invasive Why stuff has you? been yeah. FDA cleared for epilepsy and for really bad excuse me, really bad treatment resistant depression. Mm. Outside of that, I would not surgically recommend anybody put anything into their body. Big fan of non-invasive tools. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you a few really great case studies of uh, people that I've worked with that have had very, very exciting positive benefits from it. Sure, sure. I'd love to hear one or two of those. You know, yeah. I think one of the things that I find fascinating is you just said a couple of things that w were really interesting that it, it, can help you improve your memory by improving vagal nerve health using that. And that it also helps to re-regulate the nervous system. So I guess as we're learning to breathe, we can use this as a tool to begin that process. So it, in a way, it's almost like, it sounds like it's almost like a biofeedback kind of tool as well. Even, even more so than biofeedback. So there are some other biofeedback style tools like a Sensate or, um, I forget the one that's on the wrist, uh, Neurostim or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. They have these great tools that are meant as a biofeedback to say, oh, it's buzzing. Let me calm down. Or the, the mm -hmm. resonating uh, frequency is meant to calm me down. Those are great um, for practice tools. This mm -hmm. is something that I would love to physically and electrically stimulate the vagus nerve with while doing the foundational exercises mm. in combination. So I wouldn't call it a biofeedback tool, but I would call it an amplifier of the foundational tools that we're already using. That's great. Sure. Okay. Well, so so share share one or two of your case studies. I'd love yeah. to hear that. Uh, so the first one that comes to mind was a gentleman who um, came to me. He was 73. He had been diagnosed with Parkinson's mm -hmm. about uh, 14, 13, 14 years prior to seeing me. And one of his first cis, uh, symptoms was anosmia. He had lost his sense of smell mm -hmm. entirely. And his wife uh, was a nutritionist. They had gone through some uh, challenges prior to the diagnosis that we found out on, uh, took a few months to really discover mm. that this was kind of the root of it. But there was an emotional or psychological stressor that he had experienced. And within a year, his Parkinson's had just progressed massively. Yeah. And uh, she had tried everything. So holistic nutritionists living in the house, they literally tried every diet that they could try. They did all of these other tools. They said, okay, maybe this is an important thing to look at the vagus nerve. And they came to see me and uh, we started doing some work and 
uh, changing a couple things on the diet, tweaking here and there. And then we added in vagus nerve stim mm. and 10 days into using his stimulator. He calls me and he says, doc, I can smell bacon cooking downstairs. Wow. 10 days, 10 days. It blew my mind that it happened that quickly, but I've, wow. I've seen things like this happen since. And it just really blew my mind. So he's in his seventies. He's got his sense of smell back at this point, 70% of the time he can smell things. So his, wow. his uh, olfactory nerves have gotten back to normal or they're functioning way better. His energy is through the roof. He's now the star pickleball player at his club in, oh in my gosh. Michigan at, in his seventies. He can't stimulate at night because he can't sleep if he stimulates at night. So we've yeah. adjusted his stimulation time to be earlier in the day. It's just had this massive transformational effect on his life. He emailed me recently just saying he's doing so well uh, overall. Just really, really happy to uh, have something like this change his his whole life. And so um, that's one really great story. And uh, I share that one actually in the book. Oh, so, great. Yeah. I'll uh, put the link to there. that book down below so that Absolutely. people will be able to read it. Yeah. Do you, do you have a, a case story about gut health? Yeah. Um, this one is gut health. Let me. Yeah. So this one's a really good one. Um, I had a professional former world figure skating let's say champion at some point okay um very very well known in that world but came up in the 80s and during that time multiple slip and fall injuries on the ice mm -hmm. with concussions and whatnot and uh one of the biggest challenges she started developing was uh constipation mm -hmm. and gut health issues so we did some work on the functional lab testing to understand what's going on with the microbiome. We did some really good, strong work on dietary uh, support. And this was just at the time when I was starting to understand vagus nerve stimulation with electrical tools. So for the first three, four months that I was working with her, we didn't have the stimulator. Mm. And we got the stimulator halfway through her, her program with me. And from that day, has had just an exponential improvement. So wow. no more challenges with gut health at all. Significant improvement in her energy levels, sleeping mm. significantly better through the night and uh, reduction in bloating, gas and constipation uh, by that's 80%. Amazing. And that's, that's, you know, as someone who, who specializes in gut health as a holistic nutrition professional, I will say that there are so many people who may not have a chronic health diagnosis, but who struggle with constipation, diarrhea, bloating, discomfort, all different kinds of things. And so it sounds like this is something that would be supportive, even if you're not trying to address some sort of a chronic health issue. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've, had so many positive experiences for people that, and if nothing else, it improved their cognition, it improved mm. their ability to to not experience brain fogginess, it improved their energy, it supported their sleep. And gut health is one of many areas that this benefits because of mm -hmm. the wide breadth of different things that it connects to. One really important area to understand is those vagus nerve signals that come up into the brain, they don't just go into the brain. There are mm -hmm. specific circuits that are activated within the brain mm -hmm. that are vaguely innervated. The vagus nerve has a very direct effect on them. And they are meant to slow inflammation even in the brain. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, they improve your brain's ability to process information, meaning that we don't feel cloudy anymore. We don't feel cognitively incapable anymore. And mm. so I just actually got off a call an hour ago with a client of mine who started using her vagus nerve stimulator um, 
more often right before meals and she's noticed that she doesn't have the bloating she doesn't have the gas but she's wow. thinking way more clearly and she's sleeping far more effectively like just hasn't for for years had not slept through a night great and mm. as soon as she started using this tool it happened almost immediately where she was sleeping seven and a half eight hours every night consistently and and waking up feeling very rested and ready to go that's that's astonishing so would something like using that before a meal be helpful, for example, for people with gastroparesis? Because I know for them, like any meal is such a challenge. Yeah. And I would absolutely um, use it in a, in a situation like gastroparesis. And I would do it even more so because there is a dose dependent response. I would be more uh, using more stimulations early on to get the therapeutic levels uh, working so that you can get those um get those nutrients down and actually absorb yeah, them. Right. That's amazing. Well, Nabaz, as always, is great to talk to you. You have <laughs> shared so much fabulous information. This has really been wonderful and I appreciate it. Uh, for everyone who is listening, I highly recommend the book and I will be, yes, uh, upgrade your vagus nerve. I will be putting the link down below for that. I will also get a link from Nabaz, from Dr. Habib that we can put down below for the stimulator and as well as how how do people find you i'll yeah, put you that down there but me, tell us where where you are um you can find me on instagram follow me at dr navaz habib um or you can go to healthupgraded.com to learn more about me and the programs and all the offerings that we have healthupgraded.com that sounds great well i will make sure to put all of that information down below thank you again so much for joining us and for everyone who is watching, thank you for your time and your attention to this super important issue of understanding your vagus nerve. And as always, remember in all you do to make today a healthy day. Bye, folks. <laughs>